Hi, and welcome to the last session of the Legal and Policy Dev Room. We are so glad you came to participate in this remote conference at FOSDEM and um, participate in our track. Um, we are the organizers of the Legal and Policy Dev Room. Uh, I think we can go around and introduce ourselves. I'm Karen Sandler. I'm the Executive Director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. I'm a cyborg lawyer, and um, I am really happy to be here. Alex, you want to go? Sure. Uh, I'm Alexander Sander, FSFE's policy consultant, and yeah, I'm with the FSFE. <laughs> I'm and Bradley Kuhn. I'm yeah. the I'm the policy fellow at the Software Freedom Conservancy and one of the organ co organizers of the Dev Room. Yeah, and I'm Max Mehl. I'm program manager at the Free Software Foundation Europe, and mostly concerned with uh, technical issues. So we're here to talk about hot topics. Every year we do an organizers panel at the end of the day or at the end of the session because um, often we have two days. Of, no, we I'm contradicting myself though. There have been some days, some years where we've had two days in the dev room and uh, and some days where we've had one. Um, last year when it was remote, we had two afternoons and this year uh, we just had one afternoon and um, uh, we're going to probably get into that a little bit when we talk about the things that we are going to cover in this panel. Um, the point of the panel has always been to talk about the issues that were raised over the course of the um, the different talks, and then also to cover anything that we think is really important going on in software freedom right now that we think that um, we can um, shed a little light on and um, and get folks up to speed at. Um, so I think we're going to jump in. Does anybody have anything else to add to that? Thank you and introduction. Well, we we should we should also thank uh, uh, Matthias uh, from FSF Europe, uh, who helped us uh, somewhat uh, with uh, getting the dev room this year. I think he's going to be more involved next year. And uh, we should also thank uh, Richard Fontana and Tom Marble, who uh, helped co-organize the dev room for many many years. And every year we we try to get them to come back, and 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 I think they might come back next year, maybe. We can hope. Uh, so, um, so let's jump into it. I think there are. Uh, we'll probably start out covering some of the issues that were raised in the talks, and um, and then we'll go on to cover a few other issues that um, that we think we should look at. And so, I think honestly, the biggest issue um, that was raised today that I think we all have a lot to say about, and is probably on everybody's minds as you are there watching this remote talk this remote conference, um, which is about the pandemic and its impact on software freedom and proprietary software and the tech industry as a whole. And so, you know, I think um, in Idolo's talk, uh, he he uh, took a, a, a really particular um, uh, stance, which was quite negative as to um, how things went for um, free software in the pandemic, in fact, called it a major loss. Um, Alex, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, I see his point and um, it's it's definitely not a major win, let's say it like this, but um, there are also, um, I think, good things happened in the last two years uh, in the light of free software and, um, we discussed heavily the use of these tracing apps, for example, to be free software. Uh, it was uh, in the main news and uh, it was really a huge issue that they have to be free software to be able to yeah, read the code um, for data protection reasons, but also to modify it and to reuse it everywhere in the world. So that was, I think, a very good uh, discussion and a helpful discussion. And we have also seen a lot of papers on this, like the World Health Organization said that uh, all of these apps need to be free software uh, in order to make sure everybody can use uh, it. Uh, we can translate them easily and use them around the globe. And also the eHealth Network and the European Union, which is the member states and the European Commission um, had a saying and a paper on this and uh, also referred to security reasons um, so that it's good for security to have um, free software in place for these apps. So we've, we've also seen um, some good papers and uh, also some, some good solutions in the end. And um, people are heavily using free software these days. Uh, and uh, that's also a good thing. Um, I think what's key is to 
make uh, something good out of these papers we have at the moment so that we not only have um, the papers in the world uh, health organizations uh, um, library <laughs> for the next years but that we make sure that it uh, is going into legislation and um, concrete um yeah concrete steps for uh, free software and i think this is also something we will discuss later with dma for example but um yeah i think we had good debates on this and um, it helped a lot to uh, make people understand the benefits of free software in the last two years um, so this is this is what i want to add as a more optimistic thinking to to italo's talk maybe uh, maybe Bradley, you have um, some ideas on this as well I do. I, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. I, I know you're very much an optimist, Alex. I, I am. I am a pessimist and always, always have been. So, so I can give the pessimist uh, side of it. I, I was really struck by Italio's talk uh, because uh, I, I, in the United States, we tend to idolize uh, the uh, Europe as being much more friendly to um, citizens. Um, we have a lot of problems here in the U.S. Uh, with that and with lobbyists uh, uh, influencing. Uh, everything uh, in in our lives uh, and technology adoption in particular, uh, and Italio did a good job of pointing out that you have the same lobbyist problems uh, from big tech uh, in Europe that we do here, uh, where where it's very difficult to get uh, uh, government officials to pay attention to the issue of software freedom, uh, and it's a a struggle with big tech uh, to get them to pay attention. And I, I think the the, the re thing that really concerns me about the pandemic is it, it feels like a repeat of the early 2000s, uh, late 90s and early 2000s, um, when we saw a high adoption of technology, uh, you know, a moment in history where uh, regular people, average people, not computer geeks like us, uh, started to adopt technology uh, or new technologies like video chat, for example. And there were proprietary software companies like Zoom, uh, in the case of video chat, that were poised and ready to take advantage of that market uh, very quickly uh, and uh, made us uh, playing catch up with things like Big Blue Button and Jitsi, where we feel like we're trying to catch up to them constantly uh, when they have a domination in the market. And and um, and that's a really unfortunate thing and disturbing thing where where we have again, where, 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 where it used to be nobody ever got fired for using Microsoft. Now it's nobody ever got fired for, for doing their meeting on Zoom. Um, and, and that's, and it's, it's, it, we have a lot of work to do, I think, for free software to get, uh, individuals to be willing to even try uh, a free software, uh, solution, uh, during the pandemic. And so that, that's, I, I, as you can see, I'm much more pessimistic, but, but I think I'm it's wonderful that people keep trying, uh, and we have to keep trying. There's nothing else we can do that then try hard. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I'm somewhere in between. I'm a natural optimist, but as a lawyer, I'm a trained pessimist, right? So I'm somewhere I'm somewhere in the middle. And I felt the exact same thing as you did, Bradley, which is that the it seems to me like the pandemic has been a replay. Uh, like, all of the wins were so winning, and all of the losses were so painful. We were so ready with free software solutions, and yet we 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 failed to get major traction i mean there are a lot of small success stories that we can point to or there are success stories we can point to where people ha or using um you know free chat solutions i have to take a moment to really applaud the FOSDEM organizers for setting the gold standard on these conferences um, um, and having done it last year. And I'm sad that we're doing it remote again, but it's such a relief to be able to participate in a conference at such a large scale that is done with free technologies and with such commitment to those principles. And so, like, I, I find that it's uh, it's somewhere in between where, like, you know, we, we had a lot of opportunity, but just like, just just hearing the reference to the failure of the desktop to adopt um, in the pandemic, is just like, it's, it's all of our losses all over again, just like laid out in front of us. What do you think, Max? I'm also split. Um, I mean, beforehand I've been rather on the optimistic side and I'd, I would have agreed more to Alex. I can see what you said, Bradley, that, um, yeah, this is a replay and that we are catching up. Um, but I'm not sure whether the conditions are the same as we had in the early 2000s. Um, I can only speak here from, from the EU where things like uh, the DMA uh, are currently uh, going on. And yeah, actually also to my surprise, it's it went through and uh, also features like device centrality went through and uh, despite all the, the, the lobbying that uh, took part. So I'm not sure whether this levels the playing field again 
or whether big tech, as uh, I think at least two speakers uh, showed us, is already too large and can find ways around these new legislative um, thresholds for them um, that can level the playing field again. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how things will turn out to be in five or 10 years. Um, I'm optimistic that something happens at, at least. So all these that gives me a really good feeling. And uh, I think we had the same debate um, last year when we were speaking about the Zoom. Everything is Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. And uh, yeah, I have to say, at least here in, in Europe, I, I see a lot of good examples where these bad developments get turned back and where free software solutions um, are installed and where people excuse themselves and say, oh, that was a, a rapid decision that we had to make, but now we, we learned and now we're applying free software uh, in our infrastructure. So I'm, I'm not sure whether this um, is a a zero like like a zero sum game basically or whether um this whole pandemic gave us a lot of chances and started a, a really good debate and also a learning process uh within institutions within schools and so on that they really now understood the the value of free software and and software freedom and that it's really important to have yeah i'm i'm really excited about uh what yeah, will be heard uh from multiple talks uh in the step room uh this year and last year uh, about the dma um i'm i'm you you all know my big question is 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 the device neutrality uh provision actually going to work right i i mean i i i'm curious to ask every european i talk to do you think it will work will it actually be the case that you have to be allowed to install your own operating system on your phone uh in europe is is that going to happen <laughs> for will it really work I mean, if you take Apple's view on this, uh, who just recently started uh, some uh, serious lobby activities um, um, after the European Parliament passed it, um, I would say yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, for sure, it's it's just like every legislation, it's uh, you will never get a 100% win. And I mean, we had the chance to talk about this. We had the chance to have a debate. And in the end, I think we found a good compromise. Uh, for sure, we would love to see open standards in the um legislation and we are also trying to um, still be active um, around the trialogues happening now between the parliament and the council. Um, I mean, it will be hard to, to get something in, but at least we discussed it. We had nearly a majority on this and this shows us that we are on the, on the right track and that people take care about it. And this is, this is why I still um, stay so optimistic um, that, we, that we are able to reach out with our points to, to a majority. And that we are really close to a, to a majority position, even in the European Parliament and in the Council, and that we are able to have good or better compromises that um, um, we thought about uh, two or three years ago, I think. And and this is something which keeps me uh, optimistic, even if we have some downsides and. Um, if we make it happen that um, yeah, um, Apple folks are starting this um, heavy lobby activities, then we also did something good. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've always felt that that, uh, that things can be more optimistic in Europe because I, I think uh, it's easier for Europeans to see the dangers. Uh, unfortunately, here in the United States, uh, we have a a sad tradition of basically uh, being okay with companies, uh, U.S. companies anyway, controlling us, uh, and and that goes back uh, to to the you know to the to the time of uh, big oil uh, in the early 20th century. I think it's easier uh, in Europe to, to see because these are, for, from your perspective, these are all U.S. companies coming in and making trouble for you in Europe. And I think in the United States, people are, are unfortunately willing to accept these companies having a lot of control uh, because, because they're sadly because they're U.S. companies, and and that's unfortunate. Um, uh, Max, yeah. do you want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, rega regarding the. Um whether we can now, like in, in two years, install op free operating systems on all devices that there are on the market. I doubt that. Um, and I think a lot of uh, this depends on the proper implementation and also on um, enforcing these rules. And that will be a, a whole new arena that opens, right? So that actual authorities in Europe and in the national states are actually enforcing device neutrality. And that will be interesting. But I mean, as with GDPR, I'd say in the first one or two years, the actual effect was minimal on on users, on their digital yeah, freedoms. Uh, but now it's really starting to trickle down a little bit. And I hope the same for device neutrality. But yeah, of course, it's it's a completely new topic and it's, it's painful for many gatekeepers. And um, 
yeah i mean on the other hand we have a lot of um thresholds to becoming such a gatekeeper uh, i think um uh, vittorio covered this um i mean you, you have to what turnover of 8 billion and uh, yeah being active in so many countries that's that's a high threshold not every single small company that uh, produces proprietary software and, and devices will be covered by this but i mean it's a start and yeah so let's see uh, i'm i'm again here slightly optimistic you know, I just want to defend the U.S. situation a little bit. I, I'm, I'm with you, Bradley, that it's incredibly frustrating. And I would say, like, I recently have been trying to push a U.S. open source policy discussion to use a free solution for to use open source for their conversations. And um, and they took a free solution and they uh, they spent five to ten minutes with it and said, oh, this can't possibly work because, like, you know, one or two people had some issues or their, their browser crashed or, uh, or they had some problems joining. And I was, you know, the reaction is like, ah, oh, seriously, do you remember when everyone started to use Zoom and you're meeting on Zoom? Do you remember when you started to use Zoom? It took people, you know, 30 minutes to get their setup, but they did it because that's what they had to do to participate in the discussion. And you're not willing to even do like the first five to 10 minutes. It's like very, very frustrating. And so I hear you because I think that there's a lot of that going on in the United States. But, um, and I also agree that we have a legislative and cultural history of, um, of ceding a lot of control to corporate entities. And we have seen that nowhere more readily in big tech. But what we are seeing in the last two years and what I think is like echoed in this, um, in our talks, even though they weren't U.S. focused, is the willingness to call out big tech and even just the use of the term big tech and couching these issues in terms of users' rights, the impact that technology has on the public has become mainstream here in the U.S. as well. And so I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic because I think that there's like a, a lot of um, possibility to change the way that we look at our legal policies um, just over the fact that people are willing to talk about these issues in a way that they weren't before. And I think that that's um, a striking difference for our Devrim this year than in previous years. And I think uh, it's it's really, um, I wouldn't say vindicating, but reassuring to the four of us in this room, I would gather, um, that we've been talking about users' rights and about the impact of the technology in our work every day, but in the free and open source software, like general ecosystem there was more of a focus on developer rights which you know and 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 it, which i think is important but i think that in this dev room this year we saw much more of that focus shift to how, what are the impacts of that technology do, do you all find this the same thing do you do you see that trend i mean i do, i do see the i do see the trend in our dev room for sure i see the trend in our community uh and which is great because i think that in our community there's there's been i think historically there has been too much focus on developers uh and 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 the developer is some sort of almost king uh in our communities uh and that, that that's that's a problem that we had in in free software communities uh, going back to some of the earliest days i think there's uh, much less tolerance for that in the free software community. So I do see that as an improvement in our community. Um, I do feel like uh, obviously we, we there's a there's a lot of uh, bias here of our community is 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 talking about this, and I, I wonder if the rest of the world is is talking about it as much as we are. Uh, but it's of course I, I find I find being pessimistic very uh, very motivating uh, to continue work for free software. I realize most people don't, so I'll, I'll stick at being being the the, the 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 true pessimist among us and and, <laughs> and, okay, and, and so, working towards free software. So let's do point counterpoint then um, from pessimist to optimist. Alex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, as, as Bradley already somehow addressed it, I think uh, for me, the most important point is that others community talk about our topics as well. So, and, and this is something which is new and uh, which is um, yeah, still keeping me optimist. So, and uh, that people reach out to us and say, um, oh, we are writing this piece here on, um, um, mostly then uh, open source and we say hey first of all let's talk about free software and then we can introduce the concept and then um, after 30 minutes um they really enjoy and like what we are doing and and understand why we are doing this so and and this is this changed a lot in the last two years so that um completely other communities are reaching out to us trying to understand what we are doing trying to get tools trying to get help but also try to 
uh, understand the principles uh, that drives us to to um, advocate for free software and and this changed and um, so also others are um, raising our demands now um, so it's not only us in our community but also other communities understand our demands and bring them up um, by themselves because they think it's good and this helps a lot and this um, is the thing which still keeps me optimistic <laughs> but maybe max uh, you also have um, some middle <laughs> position here again <laughs> you can read my mind yeah actually yeah I, I, I do have i think i completely agree to you um on the other hand i think that the the positive things that are going on right now are that you described are more happening on the higher level so institutional level um decision making level because they know we, we got to change something, right? But I think we, sh we should not lean back and say, well, everything's handled now. The, the decade of free software has come. I think we really have to do a lot of outreach and public awareness and, and also perhaps do it differently. And as you, Bradley, said, not only target developers, but actual like normal human beings, right? So, so everyone, the, 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 the white masses more or less. And I found this um, quite interesting that we had one talk uh, covering um, a course in the university. And uh, I think we need more initiatives like these that we go out of our bubble and start educating people much earlier, like in, perhaps in, in schools and uh, yeah, in, in their younger years. So they really learn the concepts and the, the benefits of technology and also the, the threats and why it's important to, to control technology. Uh, so therefore, I think we have a lot of work ahead, especially because uh, digitization takes place so much earlier in schools and with all these video calls and e-learning courses and so on, where unfortunately still many students get indoctrinated with a proprietary software and hardware. Uh, so I think we have still a lot of work ahead uh, where we have to be active and uh, for this, Fortunately, the, the developments on the higher levels, on the political levels, at least here in the uh, EU and also in the US, as you said, are helping us. But yeah, we have to pick up this uh, good developments. Maybe, maybe uh, Brad, here. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Alex. Uh, if, if okay, maybe I can add to this to this education part because I think that's also very uh, important to educate people and to bring um, fun and free software to young people. And so that's why we, for example, started also this uh, Use Hacking for Freedom contest where we are trying to um, yeah, bring young people to uh, code whatever they want as long as it's free software and we'll give a prize to them and invite them to Brussels and also show them then um, how uh, the EU works and how legal things then work. And, and this is something um, we should definitely um, do more, I think. So like to um, connect free software also to fun and um, yeah, educate people on, on it and that's that's an optimistic thing. <laughs> yeah. and, and Karen, you've been teaching you've been teaching law students uh, and and bringing in some free software concepts to them uh, over the last two years in your adjunct faculty position, right? Yes, I have, and I just I guess I, what I wanted to comment on uh, to pick up a slightly earlier thread is that uh, is that we need to be bringing these concepts to young people. We also need to protect young people, and so like it's essential that we're bringing these concepts to university students, but. Um, uh, I, I, I was going to give you, Bradley, the opportunity to make a comment about some of the tools that are used to bring the, uh, these conversations to, in the university setting are, are, are often Zoom and Slack, right, where mm -hmm. people are mm -hmm. being forced to use proprietary tools in order to um, engage in that learning, which is really difficult. Um, you know, as a parent, I see that in the pandemic, you know, all the, the 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 kids in um in my child's class all got chromebooks that all have cameras that i i walk around and uh you know i pick up and i start putting tape over all the cameras because that's what i can do it's it's just it's incredibly alarming that surveillance devices are being just deployed into children's home and they trust them because they're coming from their schools and there's this massive power dynamic where i've talked to other digital activists who feel as i do where you know, you have to really carefully choose when and how you raise these topics so that you don't like invite retaliation against your child. Um, you know, that you don't, you don't say too much that you're so, um, you know, you make it so difficult for, for, uh, for teachers and for schools to educate children. And, and we have to do something to upset that power dynamic because we're effectively just indoctrinating a whole generation in 
tools that um, that surveil them and also take away any ability that they have to um, to like expect to engage with their technology in any kind of control kind of way. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I, 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 I struggle with the irony of, of teaching um, things about open source and free software using proprietary technology when uh, as FOSDEM uh, running all on free software has shown that you can do these kinds of massive education events online with video chat uh, with all free software. So, so it's, it's a little bit disturbing to, to think about uh, using proprietary software to teach people about about open source because it does, I think, create a sense of um, well, uh, the the old sense that we've always had is that is that open source is a, is either for you know low lying infrastructure and it's actually proprietarized when you when you change it and it's just put into proprietary projects like Android, you know, <laughs> Android being open source when you get it from uh, the uh, the uh, Android open source project. But most people's instances of Android that they're running, as Lucas said in his talk, are proprietary when they get them, and so and so I I, I really struggle with with the the promotion of oh open source is so is is one which is what a lot of organizations were out there saying but the the, the it's it just means that the non copy lefted open source stuff has ended up in a lot of proprietary products uh, and i'm sure zoom has lots of lots of uh, non copy left open source as part of their part of their infrastructure and part of probably even part of their client so it's it's really tough to to watch to watch that and to watch the 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 people are in these uh, situations where they're basically required by their university or uh, their school or anybody else to to use proprietary software. Uh, I, I mean, you can't even abstain anymore, which which is which is is frightening for me. Right. I just want to highlight what you've said in part because I also don't want to be too unduly critical of um, of our speaker or other people who are teaching using proprietary software because often faculty members, uh, especially adjunct faculty, have no say over the ways in which they are allowed to teach their students. And so, you know, just because someone is, it's 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 not it doesn't cancel out the good just because they're using the proprietary solutions. It's just, it's just a bit tragic. Right, and they shouldn't be forced to make that choice. Is really it's an unfair right. choice to force everybody into. Okay, so I think that means we like, I think we could, we could honestly talk about, I mean, we, we've covered a, quite a lot of, of the themes that were raised in our, um, our dev room um, through the lens of the wins and losses in the pandemic. But I'm, honestly, we will not be able to let go of this topic <laughs> while we're still doing remote conferences and while we're, um, you know, while we're still living through it. So I expect this to possibly come back, but I wanna take a moment and specifically um, move to a different topic, which is the, of the, the, the general theme. And I think this, we sort of touched on it a little bit earlier where we talked about the, the impact of GDPR um, uh, on, a, on a global scale, and we talked about the DMA um, and different jurisdictions within Europe. And I think there was a little bit of a theme um, to some of the talks today as as well about um, you know sort of like internalization, international lawmaking and policy making. Um, and so I don't know if if uh, if anybody wants to sort of like kick off some thoughts on a very high level about that. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we had this. Uh, oh, Alex, do you want to cover this? I mean, you can also go ahead. Uh, I mean, I will start with the optimistic one. Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, as, as already said, and um, I, I think um, the, the way we somehow found at the moment, like with um, starting uh, the legislation in, in Europe uh, with GDPR, but also now with, with DMA, helps a lot to have also international debates on it. So, um, uh, I think the DMA is not only discussed in Europe, but also um, in the US and will have effects for all over the world. And um, so um, I, I see um, the wish for um, easy international rules, um, but it's very hard to get there. And it's um, like getting there with international treaties and maybe in transparent courts somewhere um, um, ruling on something might be not the best solution. Um, I mean, still we can discuss these um, ideas. I think that's it's also good to to address um, these points. Um, but however, I think the way we are um, trying to address all of these issues somehow at the moment, um, for example, with EU legislation, which then will also have effects on legislation uh, somewhere else, or at least not only 
um, legislation, but the reality, <laughs> like um, if you want to sell your products in Europe and it is a big market, then um, you have to make sure that it's, um, yeah, that you can hopefully uh, install your own operating system and your uh, free software apps if you want, and also online with GDPR and things like that. And so um, this is what we are doing here in the moment. And um, as you've seen, um, we have chances to bring in our positions, even if there is a huge lobby coming also from around the world, trying to influence our laws here in Europe. Um, but we are still able to um, have good compromises in the end. And um, it's not a tech pro law, which we get here uh, with, with DMA, for example. So consumer rights are in it. Um, uh, our voice was uh, here in the debate, uh, even if we are um, a small NGO with a tiny budget compared to, to Apple and Google's in the world. And um, to stay optimistic, this gives me hope. And um, also this shows that it's possible to change something, even if you are um, not big tech. Um, but to do something good for consumers. And um, this is something we should keep in mind uh, when it comes to international uh, rule making, let's say it like this, uh, not law making. Yeah. I was a little bit wondering um, in the one talk uh, that we are now referring to um, by Christopher, um, it was mentioned that there are free software licenses like the GPL that are um, not actually in front of court where the the software violation or the, the copyright violation perhaps uh took place but actually in in other jurisdictional uh legislative systems so i was wondering uh, bradley or karen um you have a lot of things to do with um copyright enforcement license enforcement how do you perceive it from the us that so many court cases are for instance uh taking place uh in front of german courts would you, well, would, you, I, would you prefer having I, uh, an international law or an international um, arbitration court for this, or do you prefer it to be like this? Uh, well, I, 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 I think this was a was a feature, not a bug, of the GPL. Ultimately, I, I think the fact that copyleft licenses were designed as their own uh, international uh, system for assuring software freedom and that they had this uh, nice feature that they would kind of operate in whichever uh, jurisdiction they were under. Uh, I, I think there has been historically some obsession uh, with talking about uh, copyleft licenses if they need to be standardized internationally, uh, that we, we need to look to always to the Berne Convention as the only way to interpret and think about copyleft licenses. Um, I think that was an error by our community and, and the resilience of the German courts looking at the GPL and getting some, uh, so we've got good decisions and not so good decisions in Germany. Uh, and we've had uh, good decisions and not so good decisions in the US uh, and we're continuing to push forward. Um, uh, we, uh, obviously everyone knows we have a, a, a lawsuit in the United States um, working on a, a mechanism that hasn't been tried before in the United States uh, to assure uh, copyleft compliance. So I, I think that uh, I think that sometimes we miss the fact that we were able as a community to create an internationalized system that assures software freedom. Uh, it needs to be maintained and we need experts in every jurisdiction looking at the question to make sure that uh, the copyleft is complied with and maintained, but uh, but it, it has this resilience of being uh, a, a valid license in all these different places and operating in different uh, legal systems and under different legal theories. So I think we actually we actually already have that internationalization with copyleft uh, 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 at this point. Uh, that's my view, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think that even if you, uh, the way things are now, even if you lose in one jurisdiction, all is not lost. I mean, and this is one of the things that we can see about uh, and why I refer to GDPR in my introduction of the topic, because even though uh, it's hard, I, I wish that we could have some kind of comparable legislation in the United States, but we are very far from um, from enacting that. Um, but U.S. citizens have benefited from GDPR because multinational corporations um, are, are looking to satisfy their requirements in the easiest way. And it's, it's easier in a way to give everybody the, the, the same rights. And so where there are jurisdictions that stand up for their citizens' rights, that often percolates in an international way. And it's the same um, with, uh, with GPL interpretation, I, I believe, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So once in, in one place, um, courts uh, find favorably that um, 
to, to protect users and recipients of GPL code that will percolate in other jurisdictions. And to centralize an approach like that, I think could be very dangerous because then you could have just one misinformed body making decisions that you know basically ruin it for everyone. Yeah, the, I have the same feeling about this. Um, what we all we know about arbitration courts is that they are quite transparent and uh, actually not really benefiting citizens at all. So um, I find it interesting that you say like this uh, uh, that that uh, basically court uh, like like a uh, GPL violations from the US are taking place in front of German courts is actually the internationalization that. Uh, that was wanted for, and that that's that's an interesting uh, interpretation. Let's say it like this. Yeah, and uh, and it came from bottom up, which I think is the best way to create this kind of structure because it came from from the free software community into the courts rather than having a, a kind of top down approach, um, because you you have to have the ability to influence uh, policymakers at the highest levels to get anything done. Uh, if you do it from the top, I'm reminded of uh, six or seven years ago. In the dev room, a speaker suggested that well, what kind of what was wrong with us? Why weren't we getting uh, software freedom added as a as a fundamental right under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the UN? Um, and and it, it was it was said as almost if it was like going to the grocery grocery market, like we could just go to the UN and ask them to add it to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and they would. Uh, I, I mean, I would certainly love to see it, uh, but I think it's probably not worth doing the effort because because it, it's it's unlikely we can succeed. Uh, and so I, I think that trying mechanisms that have a bottom up approach, uh, as I think free software did from the very beginning, uh, has, has where we've been successful, it's when we've done it from that approach. Alex, do you have anything to add? No, not really. I mean, I, I like the idea of this bottom up approach. So that's um, that's um, interesting thinking to, to come to the conclusion um, to go through this way. Um, that's a bit new to me, like the singing, but uh, I really like it. And um, yeah, I, I mean, in, in general, as I said, um, um, I also don't think that it's um, uh, that it's worth the effort to try to get to such a system um, because there are way easier uh, possibilities uh, working at the moment. And um, as we are not like um, um, having so much resources, we should focus on um, activities where we can make a change and where we can, um, yeah, um, work for the benefits for free software. And um, so therefore I think uh, it's it's way better to to invest our resources like we are doing it at the moment. And uh, this is a successful way and that's why, um, yeah. Uh, and we, we have um, we have natural allies um, uh, doing this bottom up approach. I mean, I think the, 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 ups, uh, the upcycle Android approach that Lucas talked about of getting individuals to, uh, to who are environmentalists who are concerned about uh, devices ending up in landfills, showing them that free software is a way to keep their devices out of landfills. This is this is a, a place where we can form a coalition and the environmental uh, movement has done a much better job at, at bottom up uh, approaches to a global crisis uh, that, that needs policy change, definitely. But uh, but in the meantime, uh, we can learn from them and work with them uh, in, in, in the bottom up approach. Yeah, definitely. Max, we didn't have many talks in the dev room about actual enforcement actions that are happening. Are there any we should talk about now, you think? Or Alex? Um, or Brad? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm aware of one that takes place. I'm not sure about the, which organization it was. Uh, something with software freedom. Uh, perhaps, Bradley, you know what I'm speaking about. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah. I, I mean, that, it, it's, it's, tough. it's tough when you're... you're, you're own organization and you personally were involved with something, of course, you're going to think that's the biggest thing that happened in the year. Uh, so certainly the biggest thing that happened in my year in free software was we filed a, a lawsuit uh, against uh, Vizio, a TV manufacturer here in the United States um, under a, a contract theory in state court. Uh, we are currently uh, continuing our work. Uh, 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 actually, somebody asked me recently if we were just uh, we were doing ping pong in the courts at the moment. And I, I thought that was a reasonably good way uh, to <laughs> to describe it. Uh, and uh, but we, we really think we're going to be successful in that case. Uh, we're very confident uh, and we feel that this is the right approach uh, because it focuses on the rights 
of individual consumers uh, receiving source code and uh, asking a court to provide that source code as the GPL requires uh, to individual users. Uh, so our lawsuit is filed uh, as uh, Software Freedom Conservancy as a purchaser of TVs uh, with our desire uh, to make an alternative firmware uh, as is our right under the GPL because they're Linux-based devices. And so uh, we, we're we gonna continue uh, that kind of action and, and action similar uh, that we can find uh, to to do uh, to help uphold uh, copyleft, because I, I think that at this point uh, we we are in the situation where Android is proprietary, and it's not just because Android is a non-copylefted, you know, the middleware of Android is non-copylefted, but the G, the one GPL part of Android, which is Linux, uh, the GPL violations are so common that that many people get uh, their Android device without the source code of Linux too. And so we're we're uh, we're very dedicated to doing that at Conservancy, and uh, we're continuing on that work. Yeah, I would just like I, I would call it ping pong with the courts, actually. I, I, and the reason why I'm focusing on that is because I think that what's interesting about where that case is right now is that uh, the, the 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 legal details that have happened actually go to the heart of the very subject that is at issue. So it's not just procedural machinations that are driving the case right now um the 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 case has has actually zeroed in on you know like who has the right you know like like vizio didn't just come into compliance when uh the lawsuit was filed instead they are trying to use those um those legal mechanics to basically deny that right and um and to get the case dismissed um really z like completely zeroing in on the issues that are at stake and so i think often when there are procedural moves in a lawsuit particularly in the united states they are long and drawn out and they are besides the point of the case they don't really address what's at issue whereas here i think that uh you know we'll you know we're we're, we're really like dealing with that straight on um but it's just like an update because people who are are coming to our dev room are really interested in the like getting the advanced uh details and, and the inside scoop uh, I, I think i can say that uh that that we're uh we are now in the situation where we're um uh, there will be more um more um responses to motions filed in the next few months but there won't be any motion on them until uh, until june yeah, I, I want to be clear. It's very high stakes table tennis because if we win the table tennis match, we win software freedom for all the users of Vizio's devices. So, uh, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's a very high stakes game, and we're we're glad to be playing it to uh, to to win software freedom for everybody. Um, and what I'm most excited about that case is connecting the dots between consumer rights and uh, and the and copy left. And um, and being able to 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 draw in the environmentalist movement and the, the things that you were talking about before, Bradley. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, and I, you know, are there any other cases that we should talk about that happened um, over the the year? There, I think there's been there uh, there was a decision in um, in Italy, and there were a few other cases that were filed and possibly settled or uh, without decisions. But I think nothing that. Um, that requires a, a, a focusing on. Yeah, and there's a full. Uh, Carlo Piana gave a full talk on the Italian uh, case last. It wasn't decided yet, but gave a full talk about that last year. Um, so people could watch that talk and then uh, just read the the press release about it, and I think they'd have the full story. Yeah, hopefully we will have some uh, updates in real life uh, for them next year on this. Um, so that would be, well, that would be we, and we, most cases on your case as well. That would be yeah. would be lovely to have a uh, maybe a talk on this. Um, uh, so. I, I think there will be plenty to talk about uh, regarding the Vizio case next year. Uh, yeah, and, that would be lovely. Probably there will possibly be a submission on it, but but what, but I think speculating about whether Fazen next year is going to be in person that's the really dangerous thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we don't want because we did that. Last Last year, because we thought last year yeah, was that, well, the, we, the one we time okay, FOSDEM sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, So I don't think we should assume FOSDEM is going to be in person next year, although we all hope it will be. Well, I think we could possibly wrap it up now. We're close to um, the 45 minute mark and we want to leave time for you all to ask us questions. What do you think are the most important topics happening now? And um, 
you know, ask us about them. Is there anything that you wish we had talked about that was covered in the talks today? Is there anything you wish that we uh, had talked about just now? Thank you so much for joining, and I'm sure we're going to thank you again as soon as we are talking to you live. software system and hardware systems uh, in schools, particularly during the pandemic. And Karen, I know you've struggled a lot with uh, the situation for your own kids uh, and what they're being required to be used. Uh, and it sounds like you have more uh, stories than what you were able to tell in the thing of stuff that you faced uh, with your kids being mandated proprietary software. Yes, me and probably all of the other parents in that are here in the chat could probably like rant at each other for like a full day, but full, we could have a full FOSM just of talking about how frustrating it is to have children um, in any kind of schooling system. And um, I'd say like the most frustrating thing that I experienced is that I mentioned that the kids all got Chromebooks, but the most insidious, I don't know which is the most, it, why pick what the most insidious part of it is, but, um, but one of the things in addition to the cameras that has been so unsettling is that, um, is that it drives kids towards search. It drives kids towards the web. And so when my child wants to do basic computing things, instead of looking for software that is native to the computer or learning a package manager, which of course, they know um, like they're they're using their Chromebook and so they immediately go to the web where they are subject to all different they're just funneled into this user mode where there's all kinds of malicious um, software waiting for them to like funnel them towards consumption there's no aspect of creation and there's no engagement no ownership of their computing experience. And I think that's the most frustrating part. And so it's like, there's, of course, they have their, you know, like there's, even if they have their own laptop that has, uh, you know, a free distribution on it, the Chromebook that they get from school is like, they have, they have to use it for some things. And so it's the thing they go to first and it puts them in the places where they're most vulnerable online instead of empowering them in a way that they can actually learn something about computing and coding and 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 bring that to the rest of their lives and it's literally the opposite of when we were kids where when we used computers like we we really we had the best experience when we were tinkering when we were engaging with it yeah, but yeah I, I go ahead alex please it was me, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was Max, sorry. I, yeah, I saw I'm, Alex. Alex is in a different place. Like it, it's the it's my layout. Sorry, go ahead, Max. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, just a, yeah. I also wonder why. Why do you think uh, is that the case that so many schools are opting in to proprietary hardware and software? Like here, for instance, in Germany, I know enough uh, cases where the the federal state granted schools money to buy IT equipment because digitization in Germany is, as you might know not really up to speed and all they buy is mostly apple hardware is it because it, it's discounted or is it because teachers don't know other hardware and and operating systems or why do you think this is the case it's some combination right like here in the us uh, in the city that i'm in the um the city made a deal with google and so they're it's basically subsidized it's this theory of like well you know it's worth putting our corporate funds behind this, because if the kids get hooked on, um, you know, on our software, then that's what they're going to choose to use. And I think it's the same with Apple and all of the other choices, right? Like what, as many as there may be other than that, but, um, but yeah, so like, I think that that's, that's just, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to the problems that these large municipalities have, because it is a lot of kids to figure out how to get on a system. And if you standardize them on something, then that means that, like teachers can support the kids when they have their computers and it's problematic. It's just, it's such a, it's such a huge disaster and it's not, it's doing just a massive disservice to kids and to teachers. And the worst is that every single digital rights activist that I've spoken to around the world who has kids feel so hopeless because we each, I mentioned this in the panel, we can, we can basically rate, we have to choose our, the times that we're raising the issues and we like, 
we see our our kids be told the message that what we're fighting for is more fringe. Everybody else is comfortable with making these agreements. And in the U.S., the, there was emergency regulation during the pandemic that's still in effect where schools can consent to sharing information about kids with third party vendors. Um, that's that's new for the pandemic. And it, it's I, like parent parents literally have no control over that. It's outrageous. Yeah, so so many things have gone uh, have gone wrong during the pandemic, uh, and including uh, the impact on this conference. Uh, and and I, I think I think that it's been uh, I, I, well, I, while I'm very thankful that we have a uh, a free software platform to do it. Uh, uh, I, I I feel like we have to start saying that uh, the, the the truth of the matter, which is sadly in in the pandemic. It, remote conferences are not as good as in-person conferences and in-person conferences are better. Um, you know, I don't drink beer, so I don't miss the Belgian beer, but I, but I miss the other stuff about going to Brussels, uh, including, um, you know, including waffles, for example. Uh, and I have even more bad pandemic news, uh, that I have to give the Karen, uh, uh, uh last night I made an entire batch of waffles and sent them overnight to Karen. And as you'll see, I just put in the chat, it sadly says there's a flight delay in New York. It's supposed to be there in about an hour, and I don't know when it's getting there now. So you sent I, I mean, me more, more ba an entire batch of waffles in a UPS overnight package. Uh, but I just put in the chat the bad news about the delivery. They are not, they are not there yet. I don't know when they're getting there. I hope they're still good when they finally do get there. But I tried to get them there for right now. I was hoping you would have them to hold up as we did our Q and A. But oh well. That's hilarious. Um, well, we do have some questions in the um, in the channel that I, I wonder if we should get to. Um, yes, I saw somebody yeah. asked about why so many permissive licenses. Um, I have lots I, of I thoughts would, on that, <laughs> but, yeah, but, but I'm curious either... if Alex and Max have something they want to yeah. add about that. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of um, answers to this. Um, the one that worries me the most is that many developers especially the ones that are just starting to get into the, the coding business, let's say it like this, are more or less just copying license text from other repositories. So they think, oh, cool, this uh, software by some big tech company, I like it, so I just, it, it has to be good, so I just copy over the license file and I'm good. And this is perhaps also uh, facilitated by some source forges that where you can select the license and you have some license choice and you could you could argue this is biased but anyway people then cho choose a license and they think well no no i'm good right so i can pull in all third-party software it has to be mit in this case right um and uh, as you might know yeah with reuse we are working on this that people get aware about the licensing that they pull into their project Again, you could argue whether this is the right approach, but I think it's important that people have awareness and it's important that we teach people about licensing and copyright. And therefore, yeah. once again, back to the to the first talk that we had, it's really good that this is also taught in university and also outside of IT classes, because so many different students and classes are doing programming now. I mean, so many different sciences are doing this. They're creating software in, in the best case, then the university mandates that this software should be open access, so under free software licenses. And well, then people just do mistakes or are not fully aware of what they are actually doing when they choose the one license over the other. So this is where I think we have to really increase uh, uh, yeah, awareness among people. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. And the thing I, I'll be uh, because because I'm always the one who, who likes to say the, the controversial thing. Uh, but but it's true I, that uh, you mentioned code hosting sites. I, I, we just have to be uh, frank, I think, with the free software community and say GitHub uh, is against copyleft. They literally have GitHub employees who go to projects and try to talk them out of a copyleft license into a non copyleft license. Uh, the, the people are, are being paid at GitHub to do this is is ludicrous. And GitHub has a long history of, of saying negative things about copyleft. So if you have the most popular code hosting site in the world, which, by the way, is a proprietary software system, uh, telling people don't use copyleft, use these other licenses, uh, I don't know how we beat that. Uh, it, it's very frightening to me. I think that the message also of like, you must use a permissive license for, you know, you must use a non-copyleft license for adoption has like 
really it, it's just taken hold and i think that um we can't shout the successes of copy left loud enough um but but we're still that the disasters of non-copyleft software are are spun into like they're, they're they're not talked about in the same way like there are a few people talking about it um uh keith packard gave a great talk about this um i i think we we need to we need to do more analysis of where the non-copyleft licenses have failed and uh failed to to do their stated goal even if there was successful proprietary software that came from that uh, that result how does it actually impact people yeah, and this is um, also true. I mean, um, I'm talking a lot to administrations, uh, especially in Europe, um, around our public money, public code campaign. And I mean, we ask um, administrations to release their project as free software. And one of the main questions I always get is, what about this licensing? So um, it's really hard for them to, to understand the different licenses. And um, they are also afraid of doing something wrong here. And uh, especially as this, these are public bodies, they want to be uh, legally safe uh, whenever uh, they do something and um, should, um, yeah, also educate them um, which license is the best for public bodies to use. And I mean, we have this license for, from the EU, but uh, this is also, I would say, not perfect. And um, yeah, we should um, also make sure that administrations, uh, when they release uh, a software, use good licenses and uh, do um, maybe also use the reuse tool and um, also share their code on um, proper platforms and not just uh, randomly somewhere where they think it's um, a good thing to do. Yeah. So uh, Wookie also mentioned, uh, as I was talking about, like in-person conferences being better about the carbon footprint issue of uh, in-person conferences, which I think Wookie is correct that that's a huge issue. I, I struggle with this question uh, because uh, it's become very clear to me over the pandemic that uh, the in-person contact is something human beings expect to be able to have. And it, it's it's part of human bonding to be able to interact with people in person. And I don't think that technology is an appropriate substitute for that. And so, I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the carbon footprint thing, but also I, I think that our community um, really relied on meeting in person because we were already remote. I, I feel like the free software community had figured this whole out, whole thing out. Like we're remote almost the whole year, but we have all these conferences throughout the year, you know, 10 or 15 conferences that people go to and see each other. Um, and uh, I don't know how we solve the carbon footprint problem, but I, I think the I think free software has been really negatively impacted by no one being able to go in conferences. And I haven't seen any of my colleagues in Europe in person for, for years uh, at this point. Uh, and I, I don't know if others feel the same about this, but I, I struggle with that question of the carbon footprint uh, with in-person conferences. I think we all agree. I think the silence here is agreement. This is, it's so tricky. And we, you know, like conservancy is a, uh, Software Freedom Conservancy is a fully remote organization. So it's like really tough for a fully remote, like to work at a workplace where you don't see anyone. There's something to the fact that relationships degrade and it's, uh, I think it's especially hard for activists because we're not getting that like at conferences and we see you and you're there in the chat now and it helps so much. But when we see that you care about the work we're doing, it like mm -hmm. lifts us up and allows us to be able to do that work and it gives us courage and faith. And so I don't know. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. FOSDEM is one of the few conferences that so, shows us that while giving a, letting us to be in a free format. The, the main room's going to end, but we're going to continue chatting. Uh, there'll be a link in the chat uh, in just a moment. You can click over and we'll hang out.